Christ Jesus in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, last week, Paul brought us to an experience that all Christians have, this struggle against the uh, sinful nature that lives inside of us. Paul says in Romans 7.15, For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Paul's like, I don't, don't, I don't do the things that I want. I end up doing the things that I don't want to do, the very things that I hate. And if you're a Christian this morning, you feel this. You live this in your life. You experience this on a daily basis. But this is not the only experience in the Christian life. It's not the full picture. It's only part of the picture. There's another part, another experience, and that is life in the Spirit, living or walking by the Spirit. Paul says in verse 4, he talks about us in this terms, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That being a Christian means a lot of things, but one of the things it means is that you have been given the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit now dwells inside of you. He lives in you. And in Romans chapter 8, or until Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit has been mentioned about two or three times in the first seven chapters of Romans. But in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 times. And so this chapter is about the Spirit, about the Spirit and His work in our life as Christians. And where Paul is going, where he's taking us, is to teach us how to live or walk by the Spirit. But before he does that, he speaks to this new reality, this new life that we have as Christians, this new life that we have through Christ and by His Spirit. And so what I want to do this morning is just answer this question What does life in the Spirit look like? As we look at these four verses, what does life in the Spirit look like? What is true about us who are in Christ and who have His Spirit dwelling inside of us? There's three truths this morning. The first is this, no condemnation. No condemnation. Paul starts by making a profound and glorious statement. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You know, whenever you see the word, therefore, it is Good to ask, what is it there for? And Paul is using this word as a transition because he's drawing a conclusion from what he has just spoken about in the previous verses, most specifically verses 21 through 25 in Romans 7. He says, so I discovered this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For 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 in my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of the sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I myself am serving the law of God but with my flesh the law of sin. In these verses Paul has characterized the Christian as one whom sin has still has power over, still has, it's powerful in our life, that we find ourselves giving into our sin, doing the things that we don't want to do, but yet who, whose inner true self wants to serve God, delights in the law of God who wants to obey God and who looks forward to this day where they're rescued from this body of death, as Paul puts it, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, because Jesus rescued us from this body of death, what is true? Well, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. These two words, they're describing our position before God as Christians. The, the, the phrase no condemnation or to not be condemned is a legal term. It means that you are free from any debt, any penalty, any punishment. No one has any charges against you. And so as Paul says, the person who is in Christ Jesus is not under any condemnation from God. God has no charge against you, nothing against you. He finds no fault in you. He finds nothing to punish you for because you aren't guilty. That if you are in Christ, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are not condemned, and you will not be condemned, and you cannot be condemned. There is no condemnation in Christ, which means a number of things. One is it means we are not less condemned than we were before. If you, measure, if you imagine having a, a meter or measuring stick of your condemnation, and it's maxed out, fully condemned, 
When you come to faith in Christ, it's not like you have, your condemnation just goes down a little bit. It's not like it's improved a little bit. You're, you're only half condemned or something. But there's a complete transformation that has happened in Christ. There's a total change of status. And that is there is no condemnation at all. The verdict that Paul gives us is not less, but it's no. It is none, which also means it's not temporary. We are not temporarily condemned. I think too often as Christians, we can act as though condemnation, this no condemnation is a temporary thing. It's not permanent, meaning that as long as we're not condemned, as long as we don't sin. But once we sin, then we're right back under the condemnation of God. We're right back under the condemnation of God until we confess our sin and repent of our sin. And so Christians can, at least mentally, they're moving in their minds back and forth, in and out of condemnation, that when I sin, now I'm condemned until I do something, until I confess it, till I repent of it, or whatever. That's quite the opposite of what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying categorically, condemnation does not exist for the believer. Condemnation does not exist for you if you are in Christ. There is no guilt. There is no punishment awaiting for us from God. As one pastor put it, it's not waiting in the wings to come back and cloud our future. That condemnation is not over here hiding in the corner. And as soon as we do something wrong, it comes back out. There is none. We stand before God, righteous. And this is so important for a number of reasons. But one of those is just when you think about Satan, the devil, and what he does. What he's trying to do. What does Satan do? Well, there's a number of things. But two, as it relates to this one Satan tries to get us to excuse our sin, right? He tries to get us to make light of our sin or think that sin isn't that big of a deal. We're not hurting anyone to to justify our sin. But then what happens when we sin? Well, then Satan accuses us of our sin. You know, Revelation 12, 10 describes Satan as the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night, day and night. He is the accuser, that when he sins and you feel accusation against you for your sin, it is Satan. Satan wants us to get us to sin in order to accuse us of sin, in order to to feel condemned, in order to get us to live under guilt and shame, because when we live under guilt and shame, what happens? Well, you tend to withdraw from God. And when you feel condemned, feel guilty, feel ashamed, you feel like you need to withdraw, we tend to pull back from God. We tend to feel like we're unable to be used by God. Because how can God use someone like you? How can God use someone like you who is sexually immoral? How how can God use someone like you who is just raged on your kids or your spouse? Right? That's what goes through our minds. We feel this accusation of shame and guilt, and we withdraw from God, and this is where Satan wants us to be. But see, as a Christian, as someone who is in Christ, you belong to Christ, and you have his spirit. As Paul says in Romans 8, 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. On the contrary, if you are in Christ, you do belong to him, and you have his spirit. In the ministry of the Holy Spirit, does the exact opposite of what Satan tries to do. The ministry of the Holy Spirit reminds you of the glorious truth, this glorious reality where there is no condemnation. There is no punishment for your sin in Christ. There can never be condemnation for us ever again. In fact, as Paul says in Romans 5, 1, we have peace with God. As he says at the end of Romans chapter 8, as he gets to the very end, this kind of crescendo, for I am persuaded that neither life nor death, angels nor rulers, things present or things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything created, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Your sin, it can't separate you from God if you're in Christ. Because you are not condemned. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Number two, freedom. Therefore, in verse one, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life 
in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Remember from last week, Paul uses the word law, but he uses it in different ways. There's three ways in which Paul seems to use the word law. One is just God's law, God's standard of right and wrong. Second is more as a a general principle, like cats are worthless, or whatever you think. Some general principle. Or like a force or a power. Now how is Paul using law here in verse 2? Well, it seems to me like he's using it in the third way, that he's using it to carry the idea out, this idea of a force or power in our life. And that's how Paul talks about sin, that sin has this power over us. In chapter 6, we saw this again and again and again. He says in verse 6 of chapter 6, the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Or verse 14, for sin will not rule over you. Verse 18, and having been set free from sin, that sin is like this master over us who has power over us, ruling us. But what Paul says then in verse 2 is that in Jesus, through his spirit, we've been set free. The NLT translates it this way, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power that leads to death, the power of sin that leads to death. There are two laws, two powers present in the life of the Christian, sin and the spirit. And last week we saw in Romans 7, 14 through 25, Paul is lamenting over this power of sin in his life that causes him to do the very thing that he doesn't want to do. I don't do what I want and I do what I hate. But now in chapter eight, he answers the question, how do I become free from this bondage to sin or the power of sin in my life. Trying harder? Doing more? No, he says, by the power of the Spirit. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The Spirit of Christ, he is more powerful than the power or law of sin in your life. And by his power, he has set us free from this bondage or enslavement to our sin, to doing the very thing that we don't want to do. In other words, we don't have to sin. You don't have to sin if you're a Christian. Because you've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is more powerful than your sin. And so how are we free from sin? Through the Spirit's power, by walking in the Spirit, by living in the Spirit. For the power of the Spirit is greater than the power of sin. And so what does life in the Spirit look like? Well, it's freedom, liberation, freedom from our sexual sin, freedom from envy, freedom from lust, freedom from hate, freedom from bitterness, freedom from jealousy, freedom from sin whatever that is in our life. The Romans 8, 1, 8 verse 1 tells us we are free from the guilt of sin, while verse 2 tells us that we are free from the power of sin. Now, some wonder, though, about the relationship here between verses 1 and 2. How do these two verses work together? Because Paul says there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That basically, there's no condemnation for Christians because the Holy Spirit frees us from sin. Now, some people could mistakenly read this to think that our sanctification by the Holy Spirit is the cause or the source or the ground of our justification or righteousness before God. In other words, that as we fight against our sin and try to obey God, that we are somehow made right with God. But we know up to this point, if you've been following in Romans at all, we know that this is quite the antithesis of what Paul talks about in Romans, that he rejects that idea altogether. So what is Paul saying? He's not saying that somehow we have the spirit to now empower us to do what's right in order for God to accept us. That's not what he's getting at. In other words, what he's saying is we know we are not condemned. We are out of condemnation because God has sent his Holy Spirit into our life to free us from sin. The fact that you can live in freedom from sin is confirmation that you have the Spirit of God, that you are in Christ. 
that you are no longer and will not ever experience condemnation for your sin. That when you die and stand before God, there will be no judgment against your sin toward you for sin and punishment in hell. Rather, you will be with the Lord and you can live in that reality now. Now, how did God do this? How did he remove our guilt and free us from sin's power? And what Paul does in the, in the next verse, verses 3 and 4, is he goes on to describe God's work in more detail. And he wants to make it painstakingly clear that what we have is not because of us. That this no condemnation and freedom from sin has nothing to do with you and me. We didn't do anything. The, the law didn't do anything. You gotta remember again his context that Paul is dealing with those who held to the law, the Jewish, the, the Mosaic law. They thought I can do certain things in order to obtain my righteousness before God. But Paul says in verse three, for what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Now Paul is switching I think his meaning or use of the word law here from the power that he was talking about with the Holy Spirit and with sin to meaning his own law, his standard. He says, for what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh. Well, the law, what could it do? Well, the law can do many things. It guides us, it teaches us, it tells us about the character of God. It, it shows us what the standard is for right and wrong living. And when we don't do what it says, it shows that we are sinners, that we have disobeyed. But the one thing the law cannot do is it cannot give you and I the power to please God. It cannot make us right with God. It can't free us from condemnation or punishment for sin. It can't free us from sin's power. And Paul's saying that isn't because the law is the problem. Remember, Paul has talked about the law in Romans 7, that it's good, it's righteous, it's holy. The law isn't the problem. We are. See, the law is weak to us because we are weak. We are sinful. We are blind. We have sin in us. We can't do what the law commands. The law is weak because we are weak. Think of it this way. You think about the sun. It's a bright, sunny day outside, and imagine if... Someone has an eye that is blind, or two eyes that are blind. Whose fault is it that that eye can't get the light of the sun? The sun or the eye? Well, obviously, it's the eye. It's not the fault of the sun. The sun has no bearing on whether the eye is blind or able to see or not, just like with the law. The law isn't the problem. We are the problem. We're the blind eye, if you will. The law, as one commentator put it, the law upheld its perfect standard, but was unable to empower us to live up to that standard because of the weakness of our flesh. There's nothing wrong with the law. The problem lays with the weakness of our flesh. See, the law can't save us, and we can't save ourselves. We can't make ourselves free from the guilt and enslavement that we find ourselves in, but God can. What Paul says is what the law couldn't do. God did. God did for you. And what did God do so that we are free from guilt and sin? Well, God sent his son as a human to become an offering for our sin. Jesus was substituted for us. He took our place, dying the death that we deserve. Verse 3 says, for we know, or for, we, for what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. What did God do? He condemned sin in the flesh. How? How did he condemn sin? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. See, in order for sin to be condemned, in order for sin to be defeated, Jesus had to come in what? In the likeness of sinful flesh, which means what? Why does Paul say in the likeness of sinful flesh? Well, Jesus, he became a human in order for God to do what needed to be done to deal with our sin, Christ had to become a human. But what's important to note here is that Jesus did not possess the sinful nature of humanity that we have. That he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in sinful flesh. 
that Jesus was sinless, that he took on human nature, human flesh, without becoming a sinner. Philippians 2, 7 says, instead he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. The likeness. And when he had come as a man, that Jesus is truly human, but Jesus does not possess the sinful nature. See, Jesus was tempted just like we are. In Hebrews 4, 15, he says, but he is tempted in every way as we are. Yet there is one difference. He didn't sin. He was without sin. Now, why does that matter? Why does it matter that Jesus did not sin? Because if he wasn't without sin, he could not be a sin offering. He could not give himself, offer his own life to pay the punishment, the penalty for our sin, death, because he would have his own sin that he would have to atone for, pay for, be punished for. But Jesus knew no sin. Jesus had no sin. Jesus lived a perfect life so he could do what no one else could, be an offering for our sin. Which is to say, he offered himself as a substitute to die the death that we deserve. Substitutionary atonement. He gave his life in exchange for us. Hebrews 7 says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as the high priest did do, first for their own sins, then for the sin of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself, did what? Paid the penalty for sin. Jesus came and died. Why, why did Christ come into the world? Well, he came into the world to offer his life. To bear your sin. To be punished in your place for the sin that you have committed. As Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. That when someone comes to faith in Christ, what happens is that Jesus, his righteousness is given to you and he takes your unrighteousness, your sin. And that you become righteous or you become blameless or you stand in a position where there is no condemnation because Jesus has condemned your sin. See, sin once condemned you. But now through Christ, sin has been condemned. Thus, delivering you and I, the believer, from sin's penalty, death, and power, enslavement. That through Christ, sin has been conquered. That the death of Christ defeats sin legally, our position by paying our debt, and practically freeing us from the power of sin. That through Jesus' death and resurrection, brothers and sisters, we are no longer condemned, and we are free from sin's power. What does this result in? What does this mean? Well, truth number three, holiness. Holiness. We are able to live holy and obedient lives unto God. Look at verses 3 and 4. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. Why? In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now what does Paul mean when he says in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us? Well, some take this to mean that Christ fulfilled the law for us when he obeyed it perfectly and died as the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. That in him we are perfect with his perfection. In him we are pardoned by his blood. Now, that is 100% true. And that is the foundation to everything, as Paul is talking about here. But I don't think that's the point of verse 4. I don't think that's what Paul is specifically saying in verse 4. And the reason I don't think that is because of the wording of the text. 
Notice what Paul says, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us. In us. It doesn't say that in order for the law's requirement to be fulfilled for us. Now, that is 100% true, Romans 5, 19. But I don't think it's his point here. He talks about in us, and then he connects the fulfillment of God's law in us to walking in the Spirit. To our way of living that's empowered by the Spirit. That the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the Spirit. So our walking or living is connected to the law being fulfilled in us. So here's the idea. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to obey the law for God. Not perfectly. We know that. And in no way that somehow contributes to our salvation. We're not able to obey God so God loves us more, accepts us more, forgives us more, whatever. Not in some way that undermines our salvation, like if we do sin, then somehow we've fallen out of God's grace, or now we're condemned. No, no. But the Spirit of God enables you to actually obey God. So Jesus' death is not limited to just simply our justification, our legal standing before God, that we are now righteous and blameless before God positionally, legally, but also practically to give us the ability to live righteous and holy lives. See, God has not called you out of sin. He has not saved you from the penalty of sin so you can simply live whatever life you want to live, so you can live in more sin. No, no, no. Jesus has called you out of sin. He has paid the price for your sin so you could actually live a righteous life, a holy life, a life obedient to God. See, in the flesh, the flesh, it makes the law powerless. But see, the Spirit, the Spirit of God empowers us to actually obey God. Again, not not perfectly. But see, part of Christianity, part of following Christ is obedience. Obedience is necessary. And see, obedience is not only necessary, but it is possible through the power of the Spirit. Through his power, this is what walking in the spirit is. It's obeying God. Or another way to think about it is that we are actually able to love God and love others. This is the essence of the law. As Jesus says, the essence of the law is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And what is happening in the life of the Christian is you have the ability by God's grace through the power of the spirit to love God and to to love others. To worship God, not just with your lips, just to say things, but to actually worship God from the heart. See, to be a Christian, you have both the desire and the divinely imparted ability to live a righteous and holy life while on earth. As Christians, we have been cleansed of sin and been given God's own divine nature to live in us and thus we now long for and are able to live holy lives lives free from sin lives in which we are actually able to obey god one commentator said verse 4 tells us that everything christ did for us his incarnation sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man his death and resurrection was all in order or for the purpose that we might live a holy life Christ has made us holy in order to live a holy life. And the the Spirit of God empowers us to live this holy and righteous life. And so life in the Spirit is a life in which there is no condemnation, and there is liberation, freedom from sin, and sanctification, holy living, that we are conformed more and more into the image of Christ externally as well as internally. So then here's the question, how do we walk in the Spirit? How? As I said, this is where Paul is going, this idea of walking in the Spirit, but how then do we walk in the Spirit? This is how we are described as people who walk according to the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit is connected to how we think or to what we think about 
Now, I'm going to steal a bit of Dan's thunder from next week, but he's out of town, and when the cat's away, the mice will play, as they say. So I'm going to dip my toes into the waters of Romans 8, verse 5, and then Dan can jump all in next week. But Romans 8, or 8, 5 says, for those who live according to the flesh, what do they do? Have their minds set on the things of the flesh. Things of the flesh, sin, yourself, envy, lust, hate, whatever. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. That to walk in the Spirit and to overcome sin practically in your life. Not positionally. Jesus already paid for your sin. Legally. But practically, to live a righteous and holy life, to overcome sin, requires our minds. In other words, we, the way we live and what we think about are deeply connected, deeply intertwined. To set our mind on something or to have our minds set on the things of the Spirit, it's more than simply to think about the Spirit, to think about the things of the Spirit. It's stronger than that. It has this idea of of, of intense focus on something. You're like totally preoccupied with that thing. That's what your attention is given to, consumed by, your imagination totally captured by something, whatever that thing might be. Like right now, your mind might be totally captured by what you're going to do after church or what this week looks like or whatever. So practically, what do you do? How do you set your mind on the Spirit so you can live according to the Spirit? Just give you one thing practical thing one application rehearse the gospel rehearse the gospel preach the gospel to yourself this is what paul starts with as he enters into the topic of living or walking by the spirit he starts with the gospel the wonderful truths of the gospel in verses one through four there is no condemnation for you in christ none no punishment for your sin is waiting for you because there's no guilt, there's no condemnation. Jesus has paid the price for your sin. You are set free from sin, no longer living under the power and enslavement of sin. And you can live a holy, obedient life to Christ. Why? All because of what God has done for you. He condemns sin in the flesh. How? By sending his own son. Not by sending somebody else's son. Not through some other means, by sending his own son. I mean, imagine sending your own child to go die for people who want nothing to do with God, who hate God, who live in rebellion to God, that we are described in Romans as enemies of God apart from Christ. How much must God love you? Well, as John 3.16 says, he loves you so much he sent his one and only son to die for you. Yeah, we must preach the gospel to ourselves. We must preach and rehearse the truth of the gospel. That it's so good for us, right for us to get up in the morning and to set our minds first and foremost on Christ. To tell, to remind ourselves as we read God's word and we pray the truths of of the gospel. And see, as we preach the gospel to ourselves, as we set our minds on the gospel, we position ourselves to walk in the power of the Spirit because of this principle, this reality, what you think about is what you will do. How you think, what you set your mind on is connected to how you live. It shapes your whole life. People that are consumed by bitterness, like they won't forgive. You probably know people like that. You may be like, it shapes your whole life. Someone has done something to you and horrible to you, whatever it might be, and it just, it consumes you. On the flip side, to be consumed by the truths of the gospel shapes your life. And it positions us to walk by the power of the Spirit. And we'll see this more next week. But in short, set your mind on the Spirit by rehearsing the truth of the gospel. Set your mind on the Spirit by rehearsing the truth of the gospel 
so you might position yourself to walk in the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we 